Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Dan Walker and Naga Manchetti. The headlines for you at six o'clock this morning. The biggest breakthrough in the fight against coronavirus so far. A steroid drug is now available for hospital patients across the UK. Good morning. Busy programme for you this morning. It's Wednesday the 17th of June. The top story we're talking about yes. this morning. This breakthrough drug um, hailed by Boris Johnson and um, it's been proven to help the most severely affected coronavirus patients. It's being dispensed across the UK. It's a steroid. It's called dexamethasone. Um, it's cheap, widely available. It's actually been used in Britain since the 1960s. Well, research led by Oxford University found that it cuts the risk of death by a third of patients who are on ventilators. This is a result that can save lives tomorrow, during the course of the next week, immediately, in all, all parts of the world. The second thing is from a sort of science point of view and giving us hope for the future, which is this is the first time that we've had a treatment that improves survival. And that offers the hope that there will be other drugs that will produce further improvements beyond that too. Um, now, the Chief Medical Officer for England called it the most important result so far in the fight against coronavirus. You might have seen this if you watched the Daily Briefing yesterday, where the Prime Minister hailed a remarkable British scientific achievement. Yeah, and some of it, some people who have taken it have called it a lifesaver. And what we're talking about is dexamethasone. It's going to become a word that is going to roll off the lips, <laughs> yeah. isn't it, for everyone? It's a cheap and widely available drug. You may already know it. It's been approved for use now in the most severely affected COVID-19 patients across the UK. Uh, let's take a look at the difference it could make. Um, in a trial led by a team at Oxford University, a sample of 2,000 hospital patients were given this drug, uh, dexamethasone. It found that one in every eight patients on a ventilator could be saved by the drug. It could also save one in every 25 patients treated with oxygen. Now, if it had been used from the beginning of the pandemic, researchers say the drug could have saved between four and 5,000 lives in the UK. Even if it was one. Yeah. Even if it was one. Uh, that's the thing, isn't it? We can talk to Mariam Zamir, who was given the drug as part of the trial, and the trial was run by Dr Dinesh Saralaya at Bradford Royal Infirmary. And talk to them both now. Good morning to you both. Morning. Um, thank you Good for morning. talking to us today. Mariam, 18 years old. I think you're, and, you, please, and we, you can correct me if I'm wrong, by all means, the youngest person on this trial, but you contracted coronavirus, and then you were given this drug. Tell us what happened. Um, yeah, I did unfortunately contract coronavirus and um, I was taken to the hospital 10 days after being really poorly uh, to find out it was corona. Um, and Dr Saralaya did come visit me whilst I think the second day or the first day I was there and um, he told me a bit about this drug. I wasn't, you know, I didn't really understand what it was about but then once he explained it and I read this uh, leaflet that he gave me, um, he spoke to my dad as well and um, I I signed it and I, I had that um, medi medicine every day whilst I was in the hospital and I can say it was a lifesaver and it did help me because Dr Saralaya said to me, um, in a week you'll hopefully be home and a week later I did come home. I mean, that is a re remarkable recovery and what I, what I will say, um, although this is almost a celebration of this drug, what I will say to you, Mariam, is I know that your grandfather also battled coronavirus, unrelated in terms of contracting it in relation to, to your contraction, and he didn't survive. For that, I am sorry. Um, and it must um, hurt quite greatly to know that you benefited from this, and, and at least, uh, you could benefit, but he, he, he wasn't put on that trial. Yeah, it, it does. It's really sad that, you know, he's not here, but he was old and he, he struggled with the ventilator, and, um, it's you know he's like at peace now so it makes me feel a bit more comfortable but you know it's not nice to like any life is lost to anything a virus especially uh, let's bring in uh, dr sarah who's um, obviously listening into you this morning and was heavily involved in all of this and you know when you look at some of the figures involved in this researchers saying that five thousand lives could have been saved it makes you realize doesn't it what what a, what a breakthrough this, this is and, and why it was so celebrated yesterday at the Daily Briefing. How important is it for you? It's a tremendous news, really. We've been uh, at Bradford Teaching Hospitals taking part in the recovery trial since March. And I still remember the day when I saw Mariam, uh, when I asked her to consent to take part in the trial. We adopted an approach that 
very rightly, I think, that every patient receiving treatment for COVID-19 should be part of a clinical trial to find a cure for this dreadful disease. So I still remember the day vividly when I approached Mariam to take consent for the recovery trial. Being as young as she is, I was very uh, convinced that I need to get a father as part of this consenting process. And in Bradford, we've been very successful in involving family members in consenting. And I must say, we saw some early results in some of the patients who were getting de dexamethasone. And the recovery is an adaptive, open-label, randomized trial. So we were able to know what patients were on because the randomization was taking centrally. And when I knew that Mariam was on dexamethasone, I did go back to her and say, I think I'm confident that this will work on you. And quite rightly, she improved within a week because she was on bordering. She was on the highest flow of oxygen that we could give her. And she was actually resisting that the, the, the chance that she may go on non-invasive ventilation, we call CPAP, you should have hardly heard. But luckily, the treatment helped her that she didn't need to have that. Um, Dr. Dinesh, how, how significant is it that Mariam is 18 and young, you so, know, and I, I'm not sure of any under health, uh, underlying health conditions, but how, how significant is that in relation to how receptive her body was to the drug to help fight off the coronavirus? Yes, Naga, I think at the start of the pandemic, we were told that this is a disease which is going to help affect elderly people, people with multiple medical conditions. But was not, that was not the experience that we saw across the country, as you widely read in the media, we have seen a lot of young patients. Of course, Mariam was the youngest patient we treated on our unit. Um, so there, is, there are uh, children who are much younger who have got this disease as well. But we have seen patients in their 30s and in their 40s who are otherwise very well with no other pre-morbid conditions uh, who have been affected by severe COVID-19. So I think within our unit and of course across the country, we have seen a wide age range for this disease. It does not selectively, though it affects and uh, kills a lot more people in elderly with multiple medical conditions, it has, a, it has affected a lot of people who are very young with no other pre-existing medical conditions. So that's what we need to be careful as we go forward as well when we're controlling this disease. OK, that's interesting to, to hear this morning. And Mariam, I think there'll be lots of people who uh, watched the daily briefing or listened to it yesterday and uh, heard about the excitement around this drug. And yet this morning, they're watching this programme maybe and have questions about how it will work for them or a member of their family or a friend. And here you are as this perfect example of someone, as you said, whose life was saved by this drug, which has been around for a long time. I wonder what you would say to people this morning who are, who are asking that question of, could it work for me? And, and how will it be sort of rolled out? Because you are living proof that it, it, it really is a, a game changer. Yeah, um, I do think that, you know, of course, there's been lots of research put behind this. And um, of course, Dr. Dinesh, you know, the way he uh, spoke to me about it and he made me understand what it was and how it will help alongside, you know, being on the CPAP, the ventilator. Um, I, like, but I, there's no reason for me to say no. I'd, that, that it was just a trial I thought I was helping out in, but that trial has proven to be a lifesaver. So I'm delighted that I I was chosen. Well, and we're delighted we get to talk to you, Mariam, as well. How are you today? Because often people talk about when when we talk to people who have come out of hospital and through this, they say, you know, I still feel weak or you know, I'm having trouble breathing or whatever. How how are you now today? Um, you know, it's been a month on, and um, I'm not going to say I'm 100 percent because I'm not. I'm still on the road of recovery. Um, but, you know, I still get, like, aches and pains and I do, like, struggle with breath a bit, you know, after a bit of excursion, a bit of movement. But um, apart from that, you know, I'm a lot better than before. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. It's, it's great having this positive yeah. news. It's what a lot of people have been waiting for. Um, Mariam Zamir, um, thank you so much. I'm glad you're on the road to recovery. And Dr Dinesh Saralaya, um, thank you as well for your work and, and being part of that trial and helping bring this news to us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll be speaking to the Health Secretary, uh, Matt Hancock, about that drug in about 10 minutes' time, 7.30. We'll all right. And as promised, we can now uh, speak to the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, who joins us live on BBC Breakfast. Good morning. Um, thanks for coming on. Lots to talk to you about today. And I'm uh, really keen to talk to you. I know you are probably as well to talk about uh, the medical breakthrough with uh, dex dexamethasone. We will come to that. Dexamethasone, that's it. That's the one, yeah. yes. Um, but I wanted to start with the free school meals because this time yesterday we had a government minister on the programme explaining why there wouldn't be free school meals in England. So talk us through what prompted the U-turn. Well, I, I think that we've come to the right decision. I, I wasn't involved in, uh, in, in the, the judgment the Prime Minister made, 
Uh, I understand that until yesterday he hadn't seen the uh, the video that uh, and the the interview that you uh, that you made with Marcus Rashford. I think the way that uh, Marcus Rashford has conducted this ca this campaign and made his argument has just been just so impressive, uh, su such um, uh, such dignity and uh, and emotion in how he's done that. And I think we've come to the right decision. Um, the thing is that Marcus Rashford and many others, as you mentioned, are very happy that you've made that change. We've just spoken to somebody who will benefit from that, a lady called Jane. But I think a lot of people this morning, Mr Hancock, are intrigued about the way this sort of came about because that letter was with the Education Secretary on Sunday. It was published very early Monday morning. It's been front-page news for two days, and yet the Prime Minister only knew about it yesterday. How is that possible? Well, he knew about the issue and because he announced uh, a, uh, a support for local authorities uh, last week in, in this area. So he knew about the issue, uh, uh, but he hadn't had the chance to see the, uh, the interview that, uh, that was done on BBC Breakfast. And I thought absolutely fantastic uh, interview and really brought out the, uh, the messages. And so he engaged with that and, uh, and made ju the judgment that he did. I think what matters is the substance uh, and also the way that, that Marcus Rashford has, ha, has made his case using his uh, personal story, but telling it in such a, uh, such a dignified and compelling way. So I congratulate him. I know that he spoke to the Prime Minister yesterday and um, it was really great to be able to make this, uh, uh, this, this change because, because particularly with coronavirus, you know, there are families who are uh, who are really struggling over the uh, and, and will continue to do over the summer. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really glad we've been able to make the shift. Uh, I, I just want to press you on that a little bit, because I, I think people watching this morning will, will think about the fact that, you know, there's a small business minister who was on this programme on Monday, um, Paul Scully, talking about the fact that he'd read the letter. Yesterday, Nagar spoke to Grant Shapps, who explained why you wouldn't be giving out free school meals over the summer. And yet the Prime Minister wasn't across that story. I know you said he understood about the, the, the campaign, but not about Marcus Rashford's part in that, which everybody was talking about. And I think some people, Mr Hancock, will be watching this morning and thinking that plays in to a vision that some have, that the Prime Minister is out of touch. Well, I don't think that's reasonable uh, at all. I mean, there's so, because there's so many things going on. We've got a... Uh, dealing with coronavirus, of course, and the great medical breakthrough that we'll no doubt come on to. Um, he, he's also made a very significant announcement yesterday in terms of how we bring our foreign aid budget and our foreign policy closer together. And, um, you know, that's why you have lots of different uh, people in the government. And uh, to give him his credit, uh, Grant yesterday was explaining uh, the policy uh, as it has been for, uh, for years. And then the prime minister took a fresh look at this and, uh, uh, and made the judgment that he did. So, I mean, you know, that's in, in government. If you can't change a decision, then you'd never make any progress. And I'm, I'm not, and I'm, not all, you know. I'm not dragging you over the coals this morning for the change of decision. It's not that at all. But it's just about the sort of the way things happen and, and the element of judgment and authority and credibility. Because some of your, your own MPs uh, are questioning this. One was quoted last night saying that this issue was visible from outer space. A former minister is talking about bad political antennae at number 10. And you've been forced into a corner by a 22-year-old Premier League footballer when you could have been out of front on this issue, when you, know, you, you could have been on the front foot. Uh, well, look, the, the, there's a difference between the Westminster um, uh, you know, discussion and the substance of the change that this will bring for uh, for 1.3 million people uh, over the summer, and that's you know as health secretary, what I care about, especially with coronavirus about and the impact that's uh, having, uh, is that uh, people can get the the very best health they can, and for and for kids that does involve being able to have access to uh, uh, to this sort of thing over the summer, especially this year. And with coronavirus, so you know, I've been focused on the substance. Obviously, yesterday I was focused on the um, on the on the fantastic news on the dexamethasone. Um, but um, it's also totally reasonable, I would say, for a government to listen to arguments and to make judgments on that basis. In fact, you'd criticise a government if they didn't uh, listen to the debate that's going on in public and make judgments on that basis. So I think you know, you can you can you can see this both ways. Totally reasonable. 
and um, I think the right decision. And talking about sort of um, changes, would, would you want to sort of readdress what you said a few weeks ago about Premier League footballers um, not playing their part? Oh, uh, what I did was I said Premier League footballers should play their part. And you're not Rashford claiming. You're not played... claiming credit, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. But I, but I am saying that Marcus Rashford has absolutely played his part. So it's totally. Um, t exactly the sort of thing. I mean, it, not just this um, this interview and this campaign, uh, but actually, you know, he's been volunteering throughout the crisis. I think it's wonderful. And that's exactly the sort of thing that, you know, I was making appeal that everybody should play their part, and that included premiership footballers. I was, uh, that you know, that comment was then uh, interpreted in various different ways by people. But what I, but I, I applaud him. I, look, I think that he's, he's a, He's a, you know, he's a young man who's obviously got enormous talent on the pitch, but he's also uh, got great integrity. You can see that, and it really shines through. So I'm, 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 I'm very pr proud of him, actually. Um, let's talk about this drug, because I, I know it's uh, a significant breakthrough. We've already spoken to a young 18-year-old called Mariam, whose life was saved by uh, the, the, the drug adexamethasone, um, and she's talking about how it made such an impact on her. What sort of... Um, difference do you think it yeah. will make to, to people who are able to use it now? Well, it's just a wonderful breakthrough in British science. And it, it, it's, you know, this is the first drug that's been clinically proven to, uh, to save lives from, uh, from COVID-19. And so it's a testament to British science and the way that we do science properly in this country. It will make a massive difference uh, in terms of the likelihood of surviving once you're already in hospital and on oxygen. It works, it works for those who are the worst affected. Uh, and if you're on a ventilator, then it increases, uh, sorry, decreases the, the, the chance of mortality of dying by 35%. So it, it's a very significant uh, improvement. Now, it is not a cure, and there's still work ongoing on a whole series of other treatments that we hope will be able to be used alongside dexamethasone, both earlier in the disease to stop people ending up on oxygen and on ventilators, uh, and also hopefully alongside to increase that chance of surviving yet further. So it's, it, it really is the, the single biggest scientific breakthrough that the world has yet made. And I pay tribute to the researchers at Oxford University and all those who they worked with you know, my deputy chief medical officer, Jonathan Van Tam, who's really led the charge from within government. Uh, it's been a proper team effort. Uh, yeah, and it's, a, as you say, a UK-led trial that will hopefully have much wider global implications as well. Um, there's an issue of shielding as well, uh, Mr Hancock, to talk to you about today. The Health Service Journal is reporting that shielding rules will be lifted uh, for more than two million people at the end of July. Can you confirm that this morning? Is that true? Well, we're going to set out more details very soon. The shielding programme is formally due to end at the end of this month, and we need to set out for the just over 2 million people who are shielding because they're clinically extremely vulnerable to COVID, what happens next. And we will write to each and every one of them uh, because it's, you know, they, have, you know, they have sacrificed an awful lot, and it's been very difficult for some spending over three months at home and uh, we want to make sure they're safe. It'll be based on clinical advice. So the reason that I'm not directly answering is because we want to do this properly with, based on the clinical advice. We'll write to each person. So I, I want to say to your viewers, if you are in the shielded category, uh, then we will announce very soon what the plans are, and we will write to you personally uh, through the NHS so that, uh, so that you get the, the, uh, the direct clinical advice, because it is just so important to okay, this group of well, people who are at the most vulnerable. On that point, um, Rob has contacted us this morning. He says there's been very little development, a lack of information, and that roadmap to easing. He wanted to ask you, what will you say to reassure those that they will be safe? Yes, yes. So, so that, that, this is exactly why I'm answering this, this so carefully, because what I say directly impacts on over 2 million of the, most, of the people who are most vulnerable to COVID. And uh, so we will set out the full details uh, very, very soon uh, publicly. Um, my colleague uh, Robert Jemrick will do that. And then uh, we will write individually to each of the 2.2 million people who are in the shielded category. And that will be clinical advice based on the judgment of the clinicians in terms of what is safe. So just to reassure Rob and everybody else in this category, 
the changes that we make are entirely based on the clinical evidence of what it's safe uh, for you to do. But the good news is that because the virus is uh, coming right under control in this country, there's only four and a half thousand new infections uh, a day, far, far lower than at the peak. Uh, it means that uh, the, it is much safer to do more things than, than during the peak, and we'll, we'll be setting that out in detail. Thank you very much for talking this morning. Before we let you go, I, I know, you know you, your job is a difficult one to come on this morning and to you know, do all these live interviews. I'm sure you're probably aware already that Daniel Rashford is trending on social media because you've, you've oh, called, I know. You called I Marcus Rashford. I completely Fra misspoke. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you want to try and explain yourself? Because I, I think you're probably going to have to talk no, about no, this at some stage I today. Can't. Of course I know he's called Marcus Rashford. I, I think I said that once and then several other times I said I had no idea. I just, compl I just completely misspoke. So is that one of those moments where you just sort of slap yourself on the head and... and <laughs> too, uh, too early in the morning. Right, OK. <laughs> well, thank you for talking about Marcus Rashford with us this morning yes. and everything else. Uh, Matt Hancock, it's been good to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much. That's good the health stuff. secretary who uh, explaining, if you see Daniel Rashford trending on social media, you, you know why. I think he's probably getting a bit of grief for it, but um, it is early, so there you go. Yes. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer for England called it the most important result so far in the fight against coronavirus. And this is what the government was very keen to talk about yesterday at the press conference. Conference. It's been called a lifesaver. It's a drug called dexamethasone, a cheap and widely available drug which has been approved for use in the most severely affected COVID-19 patients across the UK after some trials. We're joined now by a medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh, to find out a bit more. Uh, good morning to you. We've just heard uh, Matt Hancock talking about this breakthrough. So tell us a bit more about this drug and, and why it is so effective. Good morning to you. Well, Morning. It's so nice to have something positive to report about. Dexamethasone, it's a steroid. It was licensed back in 1961. It's been off patent for decades and it is cheap. It is cost pennies um, and a course of treatment um, in the UK on the NHS is about five pounds, up to 10 days. And it's remarkable because for the sickest patients in hospital, for those on ventilators, it cuts the risk of death from COVID-19 by a third. And for those on oxygen, it cuts the risk of death by a fifth. So it's the first drug that is proven, proven to save lives. Well, Fergus, how does it save lives? And of course, all of this has come about because we've had these trials. I mean, um, we were talking about how many lives it could have saved if the trials were earlier, but you can't do that, obviously. Um, how does it actually work? Because what, what is happening in the body that the steroid does to help at that stage when you're at ventilation in hospital? So there's, there's two stages of the disease. Um, it, this is something you absolutely would not want to use in the early stages of the disease, because what it does is it dampens the immune response. But in, in patients who get seriously ill, after about seven days after the infection, their immune system goes haywire and starts to attack the body and cause inflammation. And what the steroid does, it's an anti-inflammatory. It dampens down that immune response, giving the lungs a chance to recover. Um, and it, it's, there's been a lot of debate about it because back in the time of SARS in the early 2000s, um, the steroid was used and there were lots of trials. Some of them suggested it helped with SARS, which is another form of coronavirus, and some of them said it was harmful. So the team at Oxford University running the world's biggest trial of coronavirus treatments, they, they stuck this drug in to their trial and they said, well, let's see um, whether it will work. And a huge number of, of doctors and experts were very doubtful. You know, why are you trying this? this old steroid, surely that won't work. And they were frankly really surprised that the first drug proven to save lives and cut deaths from coronavirus is not some um, shiny new high-tech drug which um, costs thousands of pounds, but, but an old steroid which every hospital pharmacy in the world will have access to. Do you know, Fergus, last night, didn't you say it was as cheap as chips? It's been a while <laughs> since you've been able... No, but you know what? It's been a while, hasn't it, before you've been able to say something. And as you started by saying, it's positive, it's affordable, it's doable. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and there were the uh, estimations that it... Had we known, had we known right at the beginning of, of the pandemic, that it could potentially, in the UK alone, have saved 
four to five thousand lives. But if you look at Brazil, where they've had the biggest number of cases so far, other parts of the world where the epidemic is rising, um, there's a real chance for this to have an impact now. And of course, if we get a second wave in the UK, um, then this drug will be there. It's not a cure. Um, it, it, you know, it, this is still a terrible disease, but it is it is proof that medicine can intervene and it will give encouragement and that the mechanism used by dexamethasone um, can be exploited further and we'll get better medicines in the future. Fergus Walsh, really good to talk to you this morning. Thank you very much. And I think a lot of people, in the same way that you could have Fergus Walsh there and also Matt Hancock talking about this breakthrough and what it will mean for, for lots of patients across the UK. And also the fact that Fergus brought up a second wave as mm. well and that, you know, how mm. it will help with that, I think. All right, you, you just go off and do whatever you need to do now. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, good morning. You're watching Breakfast with Naga and Dan and Carol. <laughs> it is 8.33. We have been hearing about a drug called dexamethasone this morning. It's soon going to roll off everyone's tongues, mm. isn't it? Because this could save the lives of the most seriously affected by coronavirus. Yeah, clinical trials have found that it cuts the risk of death by a third for patients on ventilators and a fifth for those who are on oxygen. It's impressive so far from the trials. Professor Tom Solomon is the director of the UK's Emerging Infections Unit at the University of Liverpool and joins us now. Good morning to you. So we heard, didn't we, when we heard from Boris Johnson, I mean, he couldn't um, be more positive about this um, yesterday at the press conference. Um, was he right to be? He was absolutely right to be. Uh, this is fantastic news. And um, we're, we're very pleased in the medical community that at last we have a, a drug which will work in this terrible disease and will save lives. So tell us how it works. Well, it, de dexamethasone is a steroid. It's a corticosteroid. So uh, when you if you scratch your arm, you know it goes red and angry. That, that's inflammation. And that's what's happening inside the lungs of people with severe COVID-19. And this drug, which has been used for, for decades for all sorts of inflammation, it actually controls the inflammation and damps it down. And that's clearly making a big difference in these patients with severe COVID-19. Because what happens when a patient is battling uh, COVID-19 mm. is the body fights, doesn't it? So this looks at the level of how aggressively it fights. Yeah, what, what happens is people are infected with the virus and then the body fights the virus to try and get rid of it. And this is, this is the inflammatory response. And uh, in, in fighting the virus, it can also cause damage. It's like a, a friendly fire incident. And uh, so it's basically the body's trying so hard to fight the virus, it's actually damaging itself. And what dexamethasone does is it just calms all that down, damps it down so that uh, people are surviving who otherwise would not survive. Now, one of the things I suppose we need to talk about before we talk about the importance of this being on trial is that this isn't a cure. This is when people are still seriously ill. It's got to the point where they're being ventilated in hospital. That is when this is going to be administered. Yes, it's actually... The, so the, in the trial, it was given to all people in hospital with COVID-19. And what the study has shown is that it is effective in those who need oxygen or those who are so severely ill that they're on intensive care. So the milder patients who did not need oxygen, the, the drug didn't seem to make a difference. And it clearly is not going to stop people getting COVID-19. So all the precautionary measures that people have been taking for months and which are now easing need to continue. So, you know, people should not be going out partying saying we, we don't need to worry about this disease. But what it does mean is that if you do get the disease and you're admitted to hospital, we have a drug available now which will reduce the death rate. And, and what's amazing is that uh, normally, you, you will have, you know, over the years, you've had so many people come on and talk about medical breakthroughs. And then when you say to them, OK, when's it going to make a difference? They say, well, we have to do five years of studies. You know, they've just done an experiment in the lab or they've shown it works in, in the laboratory animal. But this has actually shown that it works in humans and it's being used for, as of last night. Patients with COVID-19 and severe disease are getting the drug. So that's what, what's truly amazing. Yeah, I suppose the advantage is that it's already been used. It's just in, in what context it's being used, isn't it? So the implication then in terms of the global effect, I mean, we're all... People are concerned, aren't they, about second wave and about how that will be coped with in terms of, in terms of the NHS and in terms of the mortality rate as well. So we have this now and it's cheap, it's affordable, isn't it? So globally, this will be used? It will be used globally. I was actually at a WHO meeting yesterday when Peter Horby 
um, announced the results of the trial and there was a sort of gobsmacked silence because I think, uh, you know, it's important for people to understand how rare it is that you have a drug like this that's shown such a big difference and is going to be available immediately. It costs, in this country, it costs about £5 for a dose or, or £40 for a course. It would, it would be much cheaper uh, in lower and middle income countries because this is a drug that's just available generically. It's not controlled by any drug company who control the prices. So, uh, you know, at the end of the call yesterday, people were, were, were saying they're going to be using it. So it, it's a really good example of British science leading the world, actually. And I think I think we should be proud as a country. And also really important to thank all those families and patients who, who were willing to go in the study. It's, it's really important that people do go into research studies because it's only collectively that we can work out what the best treatments are and, and then everybody benefits. Tom, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks very much for talking to me. And um, I now have a vision of that Zoom call, Tom, um, with gasps of joy and then all the scientists running out and just cheering. That's, the, that's what would have happened. That's it. That's you've, it. You've got it. There you go, Tom Voice Solomon. There you go, uh, Tom Solomon. We, Thank you very can much. Can we just show Tom's shot again, please? Uh, see, the little Liverpool, see the Liverpool shirt in the corner? See, not, not... Yeah, this is, this is also good news, of course, at the weekend. So, um, <laughs> you know, things are looking up. OK, well, we're talking about that because, of course, <laughs> uh, the Premier League returns uh, today and Liverpool are playing a few days' time. We can